What's up, everybody? Good to see you guys. Really so glad that you're with us, welcoming everyone watching online as well. Just wanted to say it's really my honor to pastor you today. We're in a series called Should I or Shouldn't I? This is actually week two of the series, and we're answering the question like, should I do this or shouldn't I do this? Should I believe this or shouldn't I believe this? And this is something that you don't only deal with. This is something that we here as a staff at TE Church deals with. Take a look. gross videos in church? I guess the answer is we should. So if you missed last week, we talked about some things like this. Should I or shouldn't I, as a believer, get a tattoo? Is it okay to get a tattoo? And what we came to the conclusion of is simply this. God cares more about what's on the outside. Okay, just making sure 1130 is awake. I paused and I was like, somebody, God, come on, God cares more about what's where? On the inside than the outside. We also ask the question, should I or shouldn't I live with someone that I'm not married to? Well, we kind of dug a little deeper into that topic, and the real question is, should I or shouldn't I have sex with someone that I'm not married to. And God was really clear in the scripture regarding that. And the answer is, if you are not married, you absolutely should not be having sex. And a lot of people are quick to say, wow, adultery is wrong. But what we learned last week, if you're having sex before marriage and you are not in a covenant with each other and God, in God's eyes, it's the same as adultery. So, No, you shouldn't. And the other topic that we talked about is can people from heaven, can they actually see me? Are they interested in what I'm doing? Like, is grandma up there? Maybe you've said before or you've heard, like, that's my guardian angel. Like, they're watching over me. And and sadly, I hate to kind of burst your bubble, but grandma's probably not watching over you. That right now, if grandma is in heaven, her full attention is on the Lord Jesus Christ. She's just worshiping God. So, sorry about that. Hopefully, you had a good relationship with grandma while she was here, because she's not really interested in you now. She's interested in Jesus. So here are the ground rules for this series. First, we're going to do this. We're going to look at scripture and we're going to explore what the Bible has to say on a topic. If the Bible is clear, end of story. If you have a problem with what the Bible says, you need to take that up with God, not with me. If it's not super clear, we're going to look at biblical principles and try to understand what the general theme that God's trying to teach us through his word. And then ultimately, I'll probably give you my opinion, but I will let you know that it is simply that it's my opinion. Amen? We good? You ready to go today? 11.30? Let's do this. Let's jump right in. How about this? Should I or shouldn't I gamble? Should I or shouldn't I gamble? How many of you are willing to bet 10 bucks that it's a sin? Put up your hand. Like, look around. There they are. There's the ones you need to watch out for. Should, Should I or shouldn't I gamble? Well, the truth is, on your way here, you probably drove past 10 coffee shops where you can do more than drink 
coffee, you could probably gamble. A stone's throw away right across the uh, river on the island is a casino. And in just about every convenience store that you go in, you can actually buy lottery tickets. So is gambling a sin in the eyes of God? Well, the scripture doesn't really talk a lot about gambling. And some people say, well, wait a minute. What about casting lots? Isn't that a sin? The Bible talks about that in the New Testament and the Old Testament. But really, if you drill down into that, casting laws is more of a, casting lots is more of a way to make a decision. It's kind of like flipping a coin or drawing a straw. So no, that does not constitute gambling. And there are people that are pro-gambling that look at Scripture that try to use the parable of the talents to support. They say, God is for gambling. If you know anything about the parable of the talents, there was a master that gave each of the three servants a certain amount of money, essentially, to invest. And the one that didn't do anything with the money, that didn't try to increase the money, is the one that the master was actually angry at, and he took what he'd given him back. But what I believe this scripture is trying to teach us is that God wants us to do something with the gifts, the resources, and the talents that he's given us. He doesn't want us to just bury our resources and our talents. He wants us to use what he's given us to help advance the kingdom of God and move it forward. So what, again, constitutes gambling? Would you say that March Madness, if you get in a March Madness pool, is, is that gambling? If you bet somebody five bucks that they can make that shot, is that gambling? If you play bingo on a Saturday afternoon, is that gambling? And what I think we're going to find out is no. That's not really, it might be gambling, but it's not really a sin. And I want to show you why. I think there's three questions that we need to ask if this is a sin or not. And the questions are simply this, when, where, and why? Let's look at when first. When are you doing it? Like if you're stopping on the way home from work every night at one of these little coffee places, a little gambling place, um, you might want to really look at that. But if you're just occasionally maybe going to a friend's house on Friday night, you're playing cards and you're betting a few quarters, it's probably okay. I know Lindsay and I, on our honeymoon, we actually went to Las Vegas. We took, at the time, $500. That might have been a squillion dollars 30 years ago. I mean, it was a giant amount of money. still is, but a giant amount of money. And we said, when this is gone, that's it. We're done. And it came down to the very last night. I literally had one dollar left. I put it in a slot machine at Caesar's Palace, won 500 bucks. Man, I cashed in, put it in my wallet. I said, we're going to the room. I'm done. I'm not. I had a friend that one time said, yeah, I used to gamble. Now I just go to the suspension bridge and throw 100 bucks in the river. Saves me a lot of time. <laughs> so when are we doing it? Here's the second question. Where are we doing it? Like if you're doing it again, at a friend's house, you're just hanging out, you're playing some cards, and you're betting a few quarters or whatever, I don't think it's a big deal. But if you find yourself in like seedy places after hours where the people are half dressed and there's a dude named Guido working the door, <laughs> you just might want to think about what this really is. Is it a bigger problem than it once was? And here's the ultimate question that we need to try to answer is why. Why are we doing it? Like, is it just entertainment? For somebody's birthday, you buy some lottery tickets, some scratch-offs, and you're like, man, I hope you win, you know, a billion dollars or whatever that looks like. Is that your purpose? You put them in there, somebody's stocking at Christmas time, or are you going, if I don't make this money, I can't pay my mortgage. If I can't get enough money through this transaction of gambling, when I'm taking a risk that I shouldn't be taking, and it's going to cost me something, I can't pay someone back, I'm in trouble, then I would, I would say that you really need to look at why you're gambling because now the Bible is really clear and you've crossed a line because it's no longer about entertainment, it's about greed. And the Bible's clear on greed. Take a look at 1 Timothy 6.10. It says this, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many 
sorrows. Listen, this is serious stuff. And I've seen so many people where this started out harmlessly and it's cost them their family. It's cost them their friends. It's cost them their job. It's cost them far more than they ever wanted to pay because it became something bigger than they thought. So here, here's my advice. If you look at when, where, and why, and any of those things were kind of in the negative column with you, you might want to take a look at that. And most importantly, if someone has ever said, hey, I think you have a problem, don't brush them aside. Pay close attention to what they're telling you. This might be a bigger issue, and I would recommend that you get help right away. And the last thing I want to close with this regarding gambling, just because we say it's okay doesn't mean that you should do it. I'm just showing you what the scripture says. It doesn't really talk a lot about it, but here's what you need to know. What starts as a small problem can become a large problem if left unchecked. So check yourself before you wreck yourself when it comes to gambling. Amen? How about this? I think this is interesting. Should I or shouldn't I raise my hands during worship? I think this is a, a great question. And if you're new here at TE Church, kind of just checking it out, this is something that people wonder about. And they see people, some people, like, they have their hands up during worship, and they're like, whoa, that's, um, I'm checking out right there. Like, that's weird. It makes me uncomfortable to even see them doing that. I don't understand. Is this one of those churches with, like, those holy roller kind of crazy people? Like, why do we even do this? Is it biblical? Like, what are they into? I'm just not comfortable doing that. Well, I certainly understand that. And I experienced that as well. When I transitioned from one church, I heard a message about this, came to another church where they did it. And I would say that if you're here and you don't, maybe you have zero religious background or the church that you attended before this, if you did that, maybe a Methodist church or something, they just didn't do it. So you never saw that happening. So it was very foreign to you. So let's look at what the Bible says because the Bible is clear on what we should do regarding lifting our hands. Here's what it says in Psalm 64, 4. I will praise you as long as I live, watch, and in your name, I will what? I will lift up my hands. I'll praise you as long as I live, and in your name, Jesus, I will lift up my hands. Psalm 134, 2 says, lift up your hands in the sanctuary. What's the sanctuary? Right here. And what? praise the Lord. So what the Bible is suggesting is that when we lift up our hands, it is a posture of praise. Let me say it again. When we lift our hands, it is a posture of praise. And I would say this posture is found three different places in the regular world that I want to flip the script and show you why I think this is what God wants us to do. And the first is this. When you see people in this position, and many of you have been in this position, it's up against a police car. It's a very common position for some of you. What does this mean? What are you doing? You're saying what? I surrender. I surrender. It's a posture of surrendering to God, saying, God, I can't do this. I'm not going to run from you. I'm going to run to you. I can't do it on my own. I'm surrendering to you as King of kings and Lord of lords. The second thing we do this for is when we celebrate. Man, when we're celebrating something, when the Pittsburgh Steelers go 7-0, and we what? We celebrate. They're playing the Dallas Cowboys today. All right. If you're all Cowboys fans, we're praying that you'd be delivered from that demon today, that you would leave here healed and whole. But what do we do? Man, we get fired up for the steel. We celebrate, right? Where our hands are in the air. And all I'm saying is this is a posture of celebration. And if we're willing to do it for the Steelers, why wouldn't we do it for a God that died for us and made a way when there was no way so that people like us that have lost our way can find our way? So it's not weird if you think about it in that context. We all do it, just not in church. Here's the third thing. And uh, maybe you experienced this as a child, that you felt, 
and you scraped your knee, and now you're running to your dad. And I just want to pause on this one second. That was my relationship with my earthly father. And if you're here today, and your relationship wasn't like that with your earthly father, first I want to say I'm sorry that you couldn't run to him. But you need to know that there is a heavenly father that loves you, that you can always run to, and he's running for you today. He's running. So we scrape our knee. What do we do? We're running to our dad. And there are moments in worship that I've experienced where I've been hurt. Something has happened to me. So what do I do, man? I put up my hands and I'm running to my dad. I'm running to my heavenly father. So what I would suggest, based off of what the word says, that we need to really think about having this posture of worship. I understand, pastor, I'm uncomfortable. Here's what I would do, start somewhere. So for some of you, what does that mean? Next week you're gonna come in and the music's playing and you're feeling it, you're gonna go. <laughs> this feels good, like I get this. It's a step, right? It's a step. And that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about perfection here. We're talking about progress here. And then some of you, listen, you'll get to that place and you're feeling really bold and the spirit of God is moving and you're going to be like, yes, Lord. <laughs> I'm feeling it. What's my point? There's no right or wrong here. But I would say that there is something that happened with me in my worship in relationship with God when I put my fears and pride aside and lifted my hands to the king of the universe. Just something with me. I would suggest next week that you try it. Just give it a shot. No harm, no foul. And watch what God does. So should I or shouldn't I? According to the Bible, the answer is yes, you should. Okay? How many single people do we have here? Put your hand up. Single people. How many of you wish you were single? Put your hand up. No, no, man, don't. It's a joke. No, 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 no. Sorry about that. It's a joke. How about this? This is good today. Should I or shouldn't I date someone who isn't a Christian? Okay? Should I date, if I'm a Christian, should I date a non-believer? I'm going to start with this. There are some real advantages of dating a Christian if you are a Christian because I'm about to give you some really cool pickup lines that unless you're a Christian, you're not going to get it. So if you're a Christian, men, you might want to take notes. Women, you can use these as well, whatever. But here are some great Christian <laughs> pickup lines. Are you ready? How about this? Hey, girl, I was reading the book of Numbers and I realized I don't have yours. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm here to help. I'm your pastor. Love y'all. Trying to help. How about this? <laughs> I can't read that. Man, is it hot in here or is that just the Holy Spirit all over you today, baby? <laughs> Now, if you're deep, if you're dating someone that, that's deep, you can use this. Is this the transfiguration? Because, baby, you're glowing today. <laughs> See, very few people get that because you don't even know what the transfiguration is. you got to know what the transfiguration is, so Google it. Look it up in your Bible. You might not want to use that unless you're in a Bible study together. How about this? Yeah, girl, I just got back from a mission trip, and I realized that was mission you, so why don't we... <laughs> up. <laughs> I'm t again, I'm trying to help. Here's the last one. How'd you like to join my purpose-driven life? <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, okay, well, let's talk about what the Bible says about dating a non-Christian. Well, it doesn't say a lot. It doesn't, t listen, there was no, like, Samson's not asking Delilah out to a dinner and a movie. Just wasn't happening back in the day. And here's why. And parents, I think we should bring this back. It was all arranged marriages back in the day. Wouldn't that be great today, parents? You're picking your spouse for your kid. You're like, nope, next. Nope, next. They got a job. Okay, net, but we'll try. We'll see. We'll check it out. 
So you just, you got to run that through that filter. So that was happening back in the day. But what about today? So I think the number one thing is we've got to back up and ask ourselves this question, what's dating for? What's the purpose of dating? And the thing that you need to understand is when you decide to date someone, you're throwing your heart into the field of play. You're throwing your heart like out in the open and you need to understand that you are vulnerable and that your heart, which is so precious to God and you, can be broken really easily. Look what it says in Proverbs 4, 23. Above all else, guard, what? Your heart. For everything that you do flows from it. And if your heart is vulnerable, you need to know before you start dating someone, what are these people going to do with my heart? And if you're dating someone that doesn't have a heart for God, why would you trust them with yours? Think about it. If you're dating someone that, that's no, doesn't have a heart for God, why would you trust them with your heart? It's too important. So there's a couple things that we need to think about. I'm going to give you four things really, really quick that if you're considering dating, I believe these are four areas that we need to be compatible. And the first, I'm just going to be honest, is physically. Like, you got to like, like how that person looks, and there's nothing wrong with that. I remember when I saw Linda back in the day. We were 16 years old. I didn't look at Linda and go, oh, I bet she's spiritually intellectual. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I looked at Linda and was like, dang. <laughs> That's just what I did. I physically attracted. And Linda, the first thing Linda said to me, she said, if good, being good looking was a crime, baby, you'd be serving a life sentence. I said, somebody call me an Uber. <laughs> I said, amen. She didn't say that. I'm just kidding. I wish she said that. I tell people she said that. Being good looking was a crime. I'd serve a life sentence. Isn't that a great line? Not true, but anyhow. So you got to be physically attracted. It's okay to like, you got to like that. Here's the other thing. You've got to be emotionally compatible. In other words, you have to be kind of in the same lane. You can't have somebody that's always flying in the cloud, somebody that's Got the Eeyore syndrome, if you know what I mean by that. Like, oh, everything's terrible. You got to kind of be in the same space. How about this? You have to be communication compatible. In other words, you have to be able to have deep, meaningful conversations with the other person about deep, meaningful things, not just trivial things all of the time. And then most importantly, the four things, are you spiritually compatible. Because for a Christian, if you are a Christian here today, your number one priority in all you do is putting God first in every area of your life. Check this out. Proverbs 3, 6, in all your ways, what? Submit to God in every area of your life. Get under the authority of God. You're putting God first. Matthew 6, 33, seek First, the kingdom of God, his righteousness, then all of these other things that you're looking for will be added unto you. But as a believer, your priority is seeking God. And if you are with someone that is not a believer, they're not interested in seeking God. And the Bible absolutely has an opinion on this. Watch, 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers really clear. What does it mean? In biblical times, two oxen would have this wooden device put over their shoulders called a yoke because they were to pull a wagon in one direction at one pace. And the problem is if you had one oxen that was much stronger, that was different, that was going in a different direction, that wagon would be going all over the place. And in other words, the ride would be bumpy. Are you with me? If you are yoked, if you are hooked up with someone that is not a believer, God's saying that your ride's about to be bumpy because you are two different people going in two different directions. Maybe one of you is like spiritually mature, you're strong, you're running at one pace. This other person, they're not even on the same 
page as you, let alone going the same place as you. And here's the most important thing. Listen, it isn't because as believers we are better than non-believers, but you need to understand if you are trying to date a non-believer, it will keep you from the calling that God has on your life to be a world changer. You just need to know that going in. If you are hooked up with a non-believer, the most important relationship that we have is our relationship with our Heavenly Father. If you are on unequal footing, it will keep you from accomplishing the calling that God has on your life. Amen? So what's the answer? I wouldn't even mess around with it. And some of you are like, man, I'm just kidding. It's, I feel like time's flying by. What do I do here? Like, you be patient and you trust that God's got the perfect person for you. Amen? The perfect person for you. All right, how about this? Should I or shouldn't I believe my pets will go to heaven? Should I or shouldn't I believe my pets will go to heaven? Really easy answer. Dogs, yes. Cats, no. End of, end of subject. I mean, that was quick. <laughs> so... Actually, the Bible has an opinion on this. In 3 Timothy 10, 13, it says, the dog is fluffy and faithful and is a good friend to man, while a cat is of Satan and cannot be trusted. <laughs> and that's out of the international Tim Seidler version, the ITSV right there. Um, so you can look that up if you don't believe me. That's not my opinion. That's in the Word of God. So 3 Timothy <laughs> The dog is fluffy and faithful, while the cat is of Satan. So, uh, okay, let's drill down. Let's, let's, people have asked this. You know, I, I see this on social media. Oh, Fluffy died and crossed the rainbow bridge. Like, oh, and I get it. People love their pets. I say, I, some of y'all love your pet more than your spouse. You need counseling. And one other thing while I'm on the topic, listen, I'm trying to help you. Don't dress your pet up in human clothes. That's weird and it needs to stop. Just don't do it. Don't dress your pet up in human clothes. I just heard a cat in here. I'm telling you, I just heard something meow. That's my nightmare. I don't know. So, okay, what about it? Does, does God say, hey, pets are going to make it? You, there's movies, all dogs go to heaven. Notice there's not a movie called All Cats Go to Heaven. I'm just saying. But what, what is, what's the bigger point here? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. As your pastor... I want to remain teachable and correctable and coachable as I mature in my walk as well. And initially I said, no way are pets going to heaven. It's not happening. But I thought I better do a little more research. And I started to drill down and now I'm not so sure. So let me explain why. Take a look at scripture. Look what it says in 2 Kings 2.11. It says, Elijah was taken up to heaven in a chariot pulled by horses. And I'm just saying, that would lend me to believe that there are horses in heaven. It talks about in Revelation 6, we're told that there are horses in heaven. And as I study a little deeper, I'm not as convinced as I once was that there are no pets in heaven. Now, actually, I believe there are animals in heaven. God made them on purpose for a purpose. They matter to God or he wouldn't have created them. So I believe, some of you could take a deep breath, sigh of relief, that you may see Fluffy again in heaven. Okay? So I hope that helps. Just... Check out if you have any questions, 3 Timothy in the ITSV version. How about this? Should I or shouldn't I read and believe in horoscopes? Should I or shouldn't I believe in horoscopes? And people are like, oh, horoscopes. Well, well hang on a minute. Let, let's just talk about this. Because how many of you had a magic eight ball back in the day? Anybody magic eight balls? I had a magic eight ball, and it would be like... Will she go to the dance with me? And I'm shaking the eight ball, you know. It's like, no way, forget it. It's like, oh, man, I'm so disappointed. Thought I had a chance. But it's the magic eight ball. So we do some of this stuff for fun. Again, we're asking the question, is it a sin? Should I or shouldn't I do this? How about this? Along those same lines, what about 
fortune cookies. How many people read fortune cookies? Uh-huh. Most, most of us read fortune cookies. And it's great when you get a great fortune, isn't it? You're so excited. You're like, man, this is awesome. My life is about to take a turn for the better. But what happens when you get a fortune cookie that says this? You need a mint like bad. <laughs> like, you just ate Chinese food, bro. You need a mint like bad. That's not a great fortune to get. How about this? Did you ever get this as a fortune? Uh, error 404, fortune not found. Sorry for your luck. There's no fortune for you. This is my favorite. How about this? You just ate cat, bro. So <laughs> I'm sorry. It's cat. We're back to cats. Today is it's all cats all the time at TE Church. And how about this? This cookie just fell on the ground, and you just, you just ate it. That was your fortune. So we do this. My point is, we'll do these things. Is it okay? It's all along the same kind of lines. Are, are horoscopes real? Am I going to read in my horoscope, oh, man, I'm a Libra, and there's a Sagittarius that, that's going to come into my life today, and then you go to Chick-fil-A, and somebody says, oh, it's my pleasure to serve you, and you're like, that's her. She just said, it's my pleasure to serve you. This is it. God's got it all worked out. I'm not so sure about that. Conversely, is it dangerous? Like, if you start reading horoscopes, is the next step you're going to be sacrificing chickens in your front yard? Like, that's just the starting point. I started reading horoscopes, and now I'm cutting the heads off of chickens on my lawn. It ended badly. Well, what does God say? And the bigger danger that I can see with these things are some people actually putting their faith in believing them. Is it okay to read them? I think the bigger question is, should we believe them? And the answer is absolutely not. Scripture is really clear, clear. Isaiah 47, verses 13 and 14, it speaks really clearly and strongly on this. Let your astrologers come forward, those stargazers who make predictions month by month, all of them go in error. There is not one that can save you. Like, instead of going to a palm reader, like, instead of tarot cards, you need to be really, really careful because, listen to what I'm going to tell you, just because... Most of the time, we rely on our physical sight. There is a spirit world that exists that you've got to be very careful of. There is a spirit world that exists in the supernatural, and I'm just saying there are some things that you've got to be aware of and you've got to be really, really careful of. And I hear, let me put it this way. If it were me, I would not go messing around with any Ouija boards. I'm not kidding. Like, you're opening yourself up to a spirit world that's dangerous, like seances, calling on the spirits of the dead, I would avoid that. I wouldn't even go near any of that stuff. Me, I don't even watch like scary movies anymore. You can all do that. It freaks me out. And I just don't want to put that stuff in my head. I, I'm just not into it. So I think we just need to be really careful about what we're allowing to come in and do not invite something in that you don't want in your life. Now look what it says in Deuteronomy 18. Let no one be found among you who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who is a medium, or a spiritualist, or like a palm reader, or a card reader, or any of these people calling on the dead, who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things, watch, is detestable to the Lord. So what, what's my advice? Listen, I hate to bust your ass, trilogical bubble. <laughs> See, when you got one person there that in, the, in the church that's cheering you on, you feel like you could preach all day. Like, yes. But what, what's my point? Instead of putting your faith in the stars, why don't you put your faith in the one that hung the stars in the sky? Come on, let, let's, let's do that. That's who we put our faith in. So as far as astrology, all of that stuff, horoscopes, it's not real, and I wouldn't even waste my time reading it. Amen? We okay with that? All right, here's the final thing, and this is a, a difficult topic, and I want to handle it um, with all due respect today. It's very 
very challenging and personal for a lot of people. And it's should I or shouldn't I believe someone who dies of suicide will be in heaven? Very difficult conversation, very difficult topic. And most people have a, a preconceived opinion on this. And uh, it's personal to me because I've done two funerals for people that have taken their own life. And it's really, really difficult for those involved and for, for the family and friends and how do, we, how do we deal with it. Well, we say this all the time in our church, I'm not gonna be afraid to talk about things that matter because they matter. And I think the church needs to have a voice on these issues that we cannot be silent. So when it comes to suicide, people go, well, why would a Christian ever do that? Well, you need to know, like, just this year, a mega church pastor just took his own life. Mega church pastor saw no other way out. Now think about this, that there was no hope, no other way. Do you think that he knew the Lord? Yeah. And he still took his own life. So this topic isn't just for Christians. This, this topic is for like non-Christians and Christians. We, we're seeing this happen. So I want to give you a, a couple thoughts on this. And I need you to hear me. I need those of you watching online to hear me as well because we all have opinions about this. And I know that uh, during this time of the pandemic, there are people, and I've, had, I've taken a little bit of heat from this, where they said, well, I can't believe you're gathering together. Look at you, large gatherings, and people are dying and getting sick, and look at, look at your church, and you're still gathering together. And I, I totally understand people that have that point of view. But what you need to know, and those of you watching online need to know, is something that you don't hear that I hear. And what I hear behind the scenes through texts and emails is not only is the pandemic killing people, people not gathering together is killing people. And it's doing incredible damage behind the scenes. And right now, suicide rate is at an all-time high. Marriages falling apart at an incredible rate. Addiction is through the roof all of these things. So all I'm saying is, let's try to see it from both sides. Because for me, pastorally, I really deeply care about everyone's safety. But shame on me if I ignore the scripture in Hebrews that said, let us not continue to gather together. In fact, do it all the more as the day grows closer. Because people are not only dying from COVID, they are dying from not being able to be in community and be in God's house because of COVID. Come on, God's house matters. The church, look at me, the church matters. And people are dying. I want to give you some stats. You need to hear this. This may surprise you. There are more people that die from suicide than homicide in America. That's shocking to me. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for Americans ages 10 to 34. Suicide rates are much higher in elderly American population than ever before, especially during COVID. Suicide rates have grown exponentially for women since 1999. And white middle-aged men account for about 70% of all suicides every year. And if you look throughout the Bible, you see this. Suicide is, it happened. King Saul fell upon his own sword to keep the Philistines from abusing him any further. It's found in 1 Samuel chapter 3, or 31, I'm sorry. And then King Saul's armor bearer, after he saw his king take his life, he followed suit. He said, I can't live without my king. And he took his own life. Ahithophel hanged himself in 2 Samuel 7, 17, 23, and Zimri set himself on fire after his rebellion failed, 1 Kings 16. And then many of you know that Judas, after he betrayed Jesus, actually hung himself. So should I believe that people that and what I say now, I don't even say commit suicide, I say succumb to suicide because I'm not even sure they have a choice. Will they be in heaven 
Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So God is saying that you matter so, so much, that your body matters. Like, how dare you? Why would you ever can even consider taking a life? Well, I've got a couple thoughts on that. If someone dies from a sickness, in other words, that their heart is not working correctly, no one says anything. See, I believe for many people that succumb to suicide, their brain's not working correctly. And this isn't something that they have planned. People say, well, that's selfish. Trust me, it's the last thing on their mind. It's the last thing on their mind. They're just trying to get rid of the pain and they have no, in their mind, they have no other option. So is it, is it a sin or is it not? Will they make it to heaven? Well, let me give you this in Romans 8, 38. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life nor neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Come on, nothing can separate you from God's love. That's how much God cares about you. That it doesn't matter. I think the bigger question is this. It isn't, well, did they commit suicide? Did they succumb to suicide? Will they make it to heaven? Here's the question that we need to ask. Did they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ before they took their life? That's the bigger question. Like, did they know the Lord? Because God doesn't break his promises. And he said, anyone that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. And I would say, if they knew God before, right now they are in no more pain. They have been healed. They are whole and they are with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if they didn't, it would be like anyone else. And I can't, as your pastor, just say, well, I don't know, you know, whatever works. No, no, no. There is a heaven and there is a hell. And those that have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ will spend eternity in hell. And I know that's not sexy and people don't want to hear that preached, but shame on me if I don't tell you the truth. That there is a place called hell that people that do not choose Jesus reside there. So I would say the question is, should I or shouldn't I believe that people that die of suicide are in heaven? If they knew Jesus, they're in heaven. Amen? This series is all about choosing. Should I or shouldn't I? I want to close with this today, and it's found in the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. It says this. See, I set before you today life and prosperity death and destruction. In other words, there are some things that God is going to put before you, some options that God will put before you. For I command you, notice he doesn't say suggest this, for I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Now watch the next word. Then you will live and increase. In other words, God is saying, if you do these things, then you will live and increase and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your hearts turn away and you are not obedient, if you don't do what I say, if you don't apply my principles and commands, if you're not obedient, and if you were drawn away to bow down to other gods, if you put other things before God, if you get your priorities out of whack, if you bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. So watch on 19. So this day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you, in other words, you have a choice in this, life and death, blessings and curses. Now watch what he said. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. So choose 
life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice, hold fast to him, for the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to you, your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What's God saying? Come on. He's saying choose life. He's saying in, in all the choices that you have, you're going to be faced with so many choices. What's he saying? Choose life. I know this has been a tough week, and I know some of you, if we're just being honest, some of you feel like I won. Some of you feel like I lost. I hate to break the bad news. You didn't win because Biden has been elected. And you didn't lose because Trump wasn't elected. You win because you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the name above all names. Come on. I still believe that he is the way, and he is the truth, and he is the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Come on. I still believe he was born of a virgin. I still believe he lived a perfect life. He died a brutal death. Come on. He was put in the grave after he was hung on a cross, but the grave couldn't hold him. Come on. He kicked down the walls. He rose again. He's still alive. He's still changing lives for people that put their trust in him. Come on. Let's choose life today. Let's choose Jesus today. Choose life. Come on, choose. look at me. Choose life. In your marriage, choose life. In your relationships, at your workplace, choose life. Choose life. I want to pray for you today. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Those of you watching online, I would ask that you do the same. Just Right there in your homes, just bow your heads. Father, thank you.